Welcome to the Business Trendsetter Podcast, where we talk about trends and how to grow your business. My name is Manny Turan. And I'm Adam Hartung. We are Spark Partners. We're here to help you grow and understand your business, understand what trends are unfolding in the market. And the topic of today is an interesting topic, and that is, of course, Chat GPT. It is a, uh, it's a chat bot that was created by a company called OpenAI. And there's been uh, a lot of talk in the, the past couple, uh, really, really past month since it was released to the general public. And you've get, you already have these, these sides sort of forming, uh, one side being happy that it exists, it's gonna make their life easier. And then the other side saying that this is the, the beginning of the end, that this is the whole, uh, you know, the Terminator, and this, is, and this is gonna put them out of a job. And so I wanted to put this as an open discussion today, Adam, and, and kind of tease out some of the nuances of what this means and also put this against the backdrop of many other evolutionary jumps that have occurred via technology over the past hundred, you know, hundred years or so. So what are your thoughts on chat GPT, Adam? And uh, why should people be afraid or embrace this new technology? Okay. Well, the phrase I've used for a long time is if a job requires a lot of manual effort, expect it to be roboticized. Uh, if a job is something that requires a lot of binary decisions, this, then that, that, then this, and you go, you know, you can walk down a trail, then machine learning can take that over and it'll become a computer program and uh, it won't need a person. If a job um, requires, can be taught, if a job can be taught towards most of the work can be done by the, by the mentee, then expect artificial intelligence. Because why would I want to be teaching uh, one after another after another person when I could just teach an artificial intelligence program to do the job and it can do it for a lot of people. And, and that's the course of automation. Um, and automation never goes backwards. So it, it always, it does strike me that every time we automate something and we move forward, there are a lot of people who become sort of anti-technologists. <laughs> um, I, I remember as a young boy, uh, I was taught a song about John Henry and he was, a, he drove railroad spikes and how uh, that was a good job. And then one day he was told he had to compete with a machine that drove railroad spikes. So he went out and uh, the song tells the story of how he, uh, he did go out and, and pound railroad strikes all day long against the machine. But at the end of the day, he was so exhausted from the competition, he fell over dead. Uh, and of course, the next day the machine went on. And uh, this was sort of one of those Appalachian um, songs that, that about how technology and advances of technology was ruining mankind and ruining people. Um, I don't think anybody out there wants to be driving railroad spikes all day long in the cold or the sun. Uh, and so the fact that we have machines driving railroad spikes is not a big deal. But somehow we, every time we make these steps, somebody starts screaming about it costing jobs and makes it sound like it's a bad thing. And it's not a bad thing. It's, it's people moving forward and, and giving us the opportunity to, to really apply ourselves. But at the same time, what that means is that those who don't want to apply themselves, those who want to be lazy, they find themselves, find it more difficult to compete. You know, in the days of a John Henry, if you didn't want to go out and hammer real hard all day long, then it was, you know, it was tough. And when the machine came along, it was impossible. If you've got a, a job where you're just pushing some paper around all day and it's not that hard job, you don't have to think while you're doing it. And then somebody says, well, we can replace you with a computer program. It irritates you because you had fallen asleep on the job. And you say, well, I had a nice job right. here. I didn't have to work very hard at it. And I was getting paid. And I don't like the fact that somebody says a program can replace me. But that's the same thing with artificial intelligence, right? We just, can this job be taught? Can, can it somehow replace me? I think the really interesting one that's probably on everyone's mind recently was the fact that they started asking chat GBT questions that might be on a, a computer on a college exam. And the answers to the uh, the GPT provided were better than what most students would right. provide. Um, and I can tell you one of the things it reminded me of, I, you know, when I was going to school, I had to learn to write. And you didn't get into college if you couldn't write. And then in college, you were expected to write a lot of essays. And then in graduate school, you were expected to be able to perform, to have, have good language skills. Um, I became a professor about 15 years ago, and, and not, not necessarily because I wanted to, but I was working on, on a, with a college on their enrollment. I was working on a strategy, a long-term strategy, and they said, hey, would you like to take and create a course on innovation and teach it? And I thought, well, this might be fun. I'll make a few thousand bucks on the side, and I'd never tried to do it before. 
And so I go down that road, put the program together, start teaching. And the first thing that struck me was I started asking for papers and I had graduate students who couldn't effectively write. Mm-hmm. And, and here I was writing a column every week for Forbes magazine and I was, I was fixing their grammar. I was, you know, <laughs> sentences without verbs, <laughs> you know, dangling participles, all kinds of problems with the way they were writing. And I would write them back and I started going to the classroom and saying, listen, you know, I want to teach you about innovation, but if you can't even write a simple paper at a high school level, I don't know how you expect to be yeah. successful in business. So that was that was yeah. experience I had, and it made me pretty upset. And I told the cause I had no interest in teaching anymore. That if these people didn't have enough interest to learn how to read and write or learn how to write, that I didn't have any interest in really trying to teach them anything. But now I see this GPT in a whole different way because what I would say is those students that really didn't want to learn grammar, they don't have to. Yeah. If they could get the, the principles that I was trying to get across and they could reach out to a tool that could do the writing for them, then what? Then why not? You know, what's, exactly. why not? If the, the thing here we want to do is can you effectively, I was trying to teach, could you effectively manage innovation? And I was getting hung up because they couldn't communicate to me whether or not they could manage innovation. Their yeah. language, their grammar skills were so weak that they couldn't get the, the points across. But if this tool had been, is available to them and you say, okay, I'm understanding how to manage innovation and I can tell this tool what I want and let the tool do the writing for me, then isn't that a good thing? It's, then now I would say it's a good thing, right. you know, to talk about your, your John Henry story with the steam engine and all that. I think that the people that are smart are the ones that realize that that steam engine is going to require lots of, of parts. It's going to require maintenance. It's going to require, um, you know, getting to the job site, being put together. I mean, there's lots of things that can be put in place. I want to run a quick experiment right now. Okay. I want to open up, I'm going to open up chat GPT right now and I'm going to type in, explain why trends are important. Okay. Okay. All right. Here it comes. It's starting to spit out stuff. I'm going to read this to you verbatim. Okay. Trends are important because they can provide valuable insights into the behavior and preferences of a particular market or audience. By identifying and understanding trends, businesses and organizations can make more informed decisions about their products, services, and marketing strategies. Additionally, trends can can also indicate potential future developments in a particular industry or field, which can be useful for forecasting and planning. In general, Trends help us to better understand the world around us and make more informed decisions. Now, oh, that, you didn't read that from our website now. <laughs> that I just did it a second ago. And Again, uh, what's written? Well, come back to that's great. That's really, really good. It's and, well written. It makes sense. Yeah. And I would say that if somebody was in a business context and they're trying to persuade their teammates and say, look, you know, I think instead of spending money on on the last product we've had and trying to get you know Rev, revision fifty two out, we ought to go invest in this new product line. And they called that up on Chat GBT so that they could say, okay, here's why I think trends are really really important. Why we need to invest in trends? Then boom, that's really valuable. It could help them to make a good decision. Where people are getting caught up in this equation or this this new technology is saying, but wait a minute. It, could somebody who's really ignorant or stupid use this as a way to fake it through? And my answer is uh, probably. You probably could do that. I mean, but but not to the person who's a, who's skilled a skilled listener and knows what they're talking about. If you read the articles about the college professors that caught on to this, they were skilled listeners. They were skilled readers. So when they were reading something that the student had handed in, they said, "Wait a minute." I'm not sure the student even understands what's on this page. Um, and, or, you know, this looks very much like a plagiarized something from a, from a book somewhere else. So they, they were smart and they caught it. And they could go back to the student and say, do you know what this means? Again, it's back to do you, the, the generating of the language to me isn't that important if you understand the concepts. Now, people will try to cheat. And we certainly saw that with Theranos, for example. Um, I mean, honestly, I had a little bit of interaction with that situation because I was in Chicago. I had been talking to Walgreens and Walgreens had asked me a couple of questions about what was going to be Theranos. And my, you know, I gave them some general answers about the, you know, breakthrough technologies and capabilities and all that kind of stuff. And, but one of the things I told them, I said, was you'd be absolutely sure. I said, I would never invest in a really breakthrough technology until I had seen it work in the field more than once. Cause I said, it's really good to give great demo. 
and you don't right. want to get caught up in great demo. Unfortunately, a lot of people got caught up in great demo, and the woman who was running the company learned how to fake it. And that, and that, that's, I mean, any tool can help you to fake it, right? You, you know, we, we know now that people can, can use, uh, 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 uh tools, injections of, of different kinds of drugs so they can run faster, right? And it's like, well, that's cheating. You know, how fast you're on a 100 yard dash is cheating if you use these drugs to run faster. Um, but the reality is they did run faster, right? And did they fake it or did they not fake it? In my point of view, they got from A to B as fast as possible. They might have put their life at risk doing it, but, but they got there. But they kind of faked it in that if you were called upon to do that upon demand, they couldn't pull it off. They had to have the aid of the drugs to pull it off. So that was the faking yeah. element of it. If somebody doesn't understand how to use trends in business and they pull up this chat GPT and they read it to someone and they said, great, you know what? Thank you, Sally. We really appreciate that you were right. able to get us in this direction. Here is the opportunity now for you to manage this. And they don't really know what they're talking about. They faked it and they used chat GPT to get the money. Then what's going to happen is they're going to stumble and fall down. And the people who are working with them need to be rigorous about saying, okay, where does this information come from? Do you know what you're doing? Do you know how to manage yeah. innovation? Do you know how to use trends in innovation? And I think that a lot of this is is really a matter of another another arrow in the quiver, right? There's another tool that people can use to to maybe to, to write copy or to get a, a basis for some copy. I don't think that I'm sure people will abuse it and will hang their head on it. But I think if you use this as a tool, just like uh, the uh, military, the Navy SEALs, they still have to teach how to use a, a compass and a map, even <laughs> though they have the most advanced GPS uh, out there. You've got to understand the fundamentals. You've got to understand the, the root base fundamental components and theories if you're going to make uh, some strides in the industry. And this to me is, it's exciting to me. It's interesting. Uh, I, I, yesterday when I was playing with it, I, I wrote another, I wrote a prompt and I said, uh, tell me about a, or write me a short story about two cosmic dolphins are, that are out there creating their own reality. <laughs> and it spit out about four or five pages of this saga of these two cosmic dolphins, one of them named Luna and one of them named Stella, that go out and have this adventure through this wormhole. And I mean, that was just remarkable. And it's, it's interesting. And I don't know if you've seen any of the pictures of, of them, people asking AI to uh, paint. You've seen any of those, Adam? I have, yeah. It, it's remarkable. I mean, it's just, it's a little bit scary and it's kind of cool, but it is just, it's a new domain that is exciting for us. Well, you can think about, again, I've been saying artificial intelligence is here and we should apply it. And what I've learned when I'm out with audiences, and I did four meetings last week, um, most people don't know what artificial intelligence is. They aren't near it and they aren't practicing it and they aren't trying to use it. And in a very real way, it rolls the clock back for me to the turn of the century, you know, 22 years ago, when uh, in the 90s, I was running around telling people, look, basically... You know, the world, we're going to do all these transactions on the Internet, all these things we do where we mail checks for payment, um, where we mail out invoices, mail out checks, all this hand operation, all these paper statements. This is all going to go away. It's all going to get digitized. It's all going to be on the Internet. And people would be looking at me like, you don't know what you're talking about, you know. And I'd say, well, how much have you tried to do this in your business? Well, I haven't. I haven't. I don't trust it. I don't trust it. And I don't really want to get near it. And I don't know if my customers would trust it. And I'm going to wait. And I would be like, well, okay, you can wait. And your competition is going to beat you or you can figure out how this works. You can get there. And we're in that phase right now where I think a lot of people don't know what it is. But unfortunately, too many of them aren't trying to find out. They aren't experimenting. They aren't trying to see how they could apply AI in order to get you know improvements. So think about customer service. Um, I just heard on National Public Radio uh, today, in fact, that the, the when they did this, the statistical analysis, of response times by emergency teams across the country. And all of them are going up pretty much universally. You know, if you get a call to 911 for television or for radio, I'm sorry, if you get a call from 911 related to fire or police or any other emergency, the times have gone up. And in places like New Orleans, the time of response has doubled. Now, that's horrific. That is a great application of artificial intelligence. You could have the response call answered by an artificial intelligence agent. They, I could speak into it and say, I've been in a crash. My house is on fire. I've been shot. I've certainly seen somebody shot. And there's a whole lot of things that could happen real quick yeah. with that kind of a chat 
that you've just had there where it could come forward and, and, and in initially in a number of seconds get enough information to perhaps then interface with a, um, a dispatching system and dispatch out the information that I provided so that a, an ambulance or a fire truck or a police car could be sent on a call or could yeah. route it to a detective or could route it to another location, recognizing that it might look like an emergency to me, you know, that my maybe my water pipe burst in my house because it's cold. To me, it looks like an emergency, but that does not need to go to the fire department. And then that gets rooted to a public service phone number. This is a good application for artificial intelligence, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so, and so here we have these response times are going way up. Why don't we apply it there in the public market? But think about your company. How, how well does your company respond to customer service needs? And how exactly. how well are they, you know, how happy are your customers with the responses they get? Um you know, I, I, it's not uncommon. I travel. I want to go check into a hotel, even non, even if it's not a big hotel. Often, I have to get there and stand in line to wait to check in. Um, that check in process could could be very. There, you know, uh, there are some people that figured out how to uh, automate it, and I can sit there with my phone and try to work my way through it. It's not very friendly, and it's not very helpful. And if I have questions about, you know, like is it close to the elevator uh, or you know, things like that, you know, then I, I can't get a response. But again, it's a good application. If I wanted to check into a hotel, I could just talk to my phone, you know, be like, OK, I've, I'm arriving at the hotel. I would like to go and start the check in process and perhaps take me all the way through the check in process, even give me a digital key that I could use to get into the room. And I could be very happy, you know, mm-hmm. with the type of room I have. Um, good. Another good application of, of, of AI. But I don't see a lot of people out there really trying to make it happen. That's the no. big thing. So. I know, Wayne, you and I had a conversation and you asked me, is, is artificial intelligence a punctuated equilibrium? And the answer is, it is not. But it is a technology that affords the opportunity for a punctuated equilibrium. A punctuated equilibrium is where we, cre- we, we let trends alter the way we behave such that the old ways of getting things done are replaced by new ways of getting things right. done. So the internet itself, when it first came along, was it a punctuated equilibrium? No, it was a piece of technology. It wasn't until there was adoption, and then the adoption rate started to make it to where if you did try to do things without using the internet, it was obsolete. It just took too long, took too much cost. That's the same thing that's happening with artificial intelligence. It's a fairly new technology. It hasn't yet changed behaviors in a dramatic way, but it has certainly has the opportunity to do so, and I think we can forecast that it will do so. Like, again, it, and we don't have enough data right now. You and I as trend experts, you know, we don't have enough data in terms of pickup and application and use. Um, we see the deniers in large volume saying, hey, I don't want to use chat GPT and I don't want my children using this tool. College professors you know, concerned about not about using the tool. So we're seeing naysayers. That's not going to make mm-hmm. a difference. And the reality is the people that see a benefit out of doing this, college students, people have to get quick answers to questions. You know, they're going to start to adopt this very quickly. I mean, one of the things I think about is, for example, uh, legal issues. Um, so sometimes we get hit with legal issues that we don't really want to deal with. Our neighbor gets mad at us because of a fence or uh, perhaps we want to file a permit or perhaps we've been involved in something a few years ago and and somebody feels like they were wronged. And so there's a, an initial lawsuit filed. But at the beginning of any legal process starts with a lot of paperwork and starts with a lot of filings. And most of us are in a position, if we get caught in that, we're like really aggravated because of the cost. It's like, okay, just getting the paperwork filled out, handed in, doing it properly, getting it to the right court, ends up we have to hire this lawyer, and the lawyer charges us a lot of money for something that we go, that was not hard to do. That would, you know, maybe we want to mm-hmm. file a will, or maybe we want to go file a trust and set up a trust for, for handling our assets. Um, all kinds of things like that. We often find that, hey, this did not, I didn't even need a paralegal because all a paralegal did was sit there and ask me a bunch of rote questions, write down answers, type it into a form. And yeah. this is where AI comes in. Why wouldn't you sit down if you're an attorney and figure out, okay, this is how most of this works. Let's get this this chat figured out. Let's let it all happen with artificial yeah. intelligence. And let's get to the point where the, you know, Adam can file his will or Adam could file a response to a query or a response to a deposition at, at virtually no cost, you know, five or ten dollars to get it done. And by the way, why should an attorney who's got seven years of education or apparently who has at least four years of education, why should they be doing these mundane yeah. trivial Let tasks? me ask you this. When's the last time you interfaced with with a lawyer? They well, in my are case, busy. it was about a year ago. I mean, yeah. I, I deal with them all the time, whether it's a patent lawyer or a corporate lawyer. I mean, they have so much going on. Having a tool like this at their disposal could be a huge benefit. 
Do you remember yeah. somebody named Arthur C. Clarke? No, it doesn't ring a bell for me. So Arthur C. Clarke was a, uh, a futurist, a novelist. He, uh, he was a British guy. He co-wrote uh, 2001 Space Odyssey. That's one of his claims. Oh, claim okay. I'm going to read you a couple of predictions that he, he predicted um, in the late 60s and early 70s. Okay, these are eight predictions that he got right. So the first of which is he predicted that at one point in time, we would all have home computers. We would all be able to interface with these devices at home and it would be very, it would be ubiquitous. We'd be able to have something like Skype or FaceTime to communicate with our loved ones that are, you know, a continent away. This is all in the early 70s, by the way, in late 60s. He predicted the internet in um, the early 70s as well, having some uh, brain trust of information at your fingertips, you'd be able to, to uh, get information. He predicted email. He predicted um, Google in the sense of having this platform to ask questions, mobile phones, and telecommuting. So these are just some examples of some of these things. Now, why am I saying this? I'm saying this because there is no magic wand that can hold chat GPT and AI and everything else back. It's happening. And to the extent yeah. you can be ready for it and actually lean into it, you could actually create a lot of wealth and a lot of prosperity for, for you and your company and your family. Right? The basics of what we talk about with Spark Partners and have been doing so for, for 25 years is that you do something that adds value for your customer, and that's your value proposition. How you deliver that value is your value delivery system. Your value delivery system is constantly barraged by new technologies, changes in regulations, changes in the world, and that the, how you do things can be improved. It can be changed so that you can deliver your value, the value proposition, in, in, a, in entirely different ways or better ways that meet the customer needs even better. This what is why something like AI is so valuable is because what it's what that technology does is says, look at how you deliver it to your customer and ask yourself, is there a better way? Could I use artificial intelligence in order to help my customer get answers to their questions, get their products, get their services better, faster and cheaper through a different, a different value delivery system and one that is augmented by these new technologies? Artificial intelligence will be as widespread as the Internet. It'll be embedded in everything. I mean, lately I've been shown talking to people about Inspire. Inspire is this little device, somewhat larger than a quarter. They insert into your body. And then when you go to bed at night, you use an external device to activate it. And you don't have to have a CPAP machine on your face. That is using some intelligence applied to some electronics to then help your body function better. And what we realize is this is happening around us all the time. The leaders are figuring out the applications, such as you want to sleep better. So to sleep better, rather than wear a CPAP, would you rather just you know not have to have that mask? Of course, you don't want to have that mask. So you'd rather have this alternative. So this is a new value delivery system to help you sleep better. Is this Inspire product? Um, and and that's the way I'm trying. We need to get our our people out there thinking. That's the goal of Spark Partners is to have people think about technologies as ways to develop entirely new value delivery systems to help people get the value that they really want. Yeah, and I think there's a a bit of a I, I like this term a tale of two cities in the sense of okay, you're either a, an entrepreneur, you've got a day job, you don't really have a lot going on. Um, but you want to create some value for yourself. So you see this cool technology and you start working on this in your basement and you start enrolling people to help you out and all, there's all that. And that's fine. That's one, one way. The other way is you, you are uh, an executive at a company or maybe you own a company and you're developing a widget and you're noticing that sales are slowing down and you're, you're worried. You've got 25 people to, to feed every, uh, every payroll, but you've got, you got some cash, you've got some, um, some momentum, you've got a little bit of, of a runway. Now, I think that both of those have a lot of interesting things about that person could create, say, for instance, a, um, an application using ChatGPT or something similar. One of the things that you and I, Adam, we talk to these business owners is they feel as though they're stuck. They're locked in, right? They, they've got, they maybe bought a big old building and they're sitting there on this uh, large payroll and they feel as though they cannot really make any move without disrupting the company and going into bankruptcy. 
Now, I think that is the point where I think they need us the most. So in that situation, Adam, explain to our, our viewers and our listeners why it's so important to, to not only make that move, but really do it in a systematic way so that they can um, catch that next trend. Well, it, one question that I often use in this scenario that you're talking about is I'll say to somebody, if you were starting your business today, knowing your customers the way you know your customers and knowing their needs, would you operate the company the same way or would you do it in a different way? And most people say, oh, if I was starting today, and I, uh, then I would do it differently. And so, so in other words, you're encumbered. Your decision-making is encumbered by your value delivery system. As you said, the assets, employees, what you know, the things that make up your company. You're letting that encumber your decision-making process. And the reality is the person who isn't encumbered by that will go do whatever you think is a better way. And they're going to make you obsolete that much quicker. So it, that's why it's so critical that you're able to separate this out and say, you know, my value proposition, what my customers want is different from how I deliver it. And I have to really think about the best ways to deliver it. Now, in the short term, like you know, today with artificial intelligence, there will be customers who will reject the artificial intelligence. If you try to, you know, if they find out they're talking to a chat bot instead of a human, they'll say, they'll, they'll be like, oh my gosh, I think that you lied to me. I think you treated me poorly. They'll, they'll have those reactions. In the short term, that would be a way they would react. So you have to be aware that you have to transition these new technologies into your value delivery system. But sometimes you have to just change them out wholly. I mean, it's kind of like, how long did you expect Netflix to keep sending out DVDs when streaming came along and just made DVDs obsolete? And if they didn't tr switch really, really fast, they wouldn't have survived. So you can look at it as a transition period, but don't expect that transition period to necessarily be long. It could be very, very quick in terms of shifting people over. But the whole point is, if you could start all over again today and you had some money and you had some customers, and you had some revenues, what's the value delivery system you'd create today, knowing what you know, yeah. that's different from how you do it today? And the beauty of, of uh, you having those, quote unquote, encumbrances by having your company <laughs> is that those encumbrances can, in, in the right way, can be used as resources. You know, if you're somebody, yeah. some startup person in their, in their basement working a day job, you may not have the cash or the or the the um, uh, the resources to make something happen, but if you've got twenty five employees, you might be able to carve out two or three of them in the manner of the blank space concept, which we've talked about many times, and it's part of our course to go out and venture forth and explore a new and uh, potentially better market to serve with your value through a through your value delivery. I mean, the University of Phoenix has been around for 20 years. Southern New Hampshire University has been around even longer than that. I mean, in terms of being an online education tool, they've both been around longer. But it's an online education tool. They've been around for a long time. But they were scoffed at. They were ignored. People said, oh, online education isn't the same as going to a sit-down college in classroom, in class education. So people scoffed at it. But look at today. I mean, I know a lot of colleges that didn't survive the last 25 years. I'm being honest, didn't survive. The college itself is gone. The buildings have been transferred off into another use. There are, there are no students. And if you're a graduate of those colleges, you have a piece of paper on the wall that people go, oh, you're graduated from school, doesn't even exist. Can't even go back and, and try to get your, uh, your grades re reported out, right? Because there's no one there anymore. But the Southern New Hampshire universities and the Phoenix of the world that said, hey, if I could build an educational system from scratch, would I have buildings or would I do it another way? See, they developed a whole new value delivery system saying I wouldn't invest in the buildings and the professors teaching in a class. That is an expensive way to go about it. Uh, there's certain values to that, but you can only educate a certain number of people that way. You know, we could we can meet the goal that a lot of people have of getting an education and a degree with this new value delivery system. And they were very successful, even though the competition scoffed at them, even though a lot of customers scoffed at them, you know, they, they moved it forward. And that, that's the underlying theme of the work we do at Spark Partners is that you constantly have to be evaluating your value delivery system. Artificial intelligence is real. Artificial intelligence is here. It's being implied, applied in ways that many of our listeners perhaps don't even know is being applied. And it can well be applied in their marketplace and in their products in ways they don't know. And if they don't get smart and get smart quick, somebody else is going to steal their customers away. Yeah, very well said. You know, a good example of that 
um, progressive thinking, looking at the trends and looking at how to really capitalize on what's happening is, uh, is a university here in Arizona called Arizona State University, which is a bit of the, my rival as being a U of A person. But nonetheless, I respect what they're doing. They have now become the largest university by enrollment in the United States. A combination of in-person and online classes, they're looking at 140,000 students. The next one after that is, I think, uh, University of Florida with uh, 77,000. And so why did this happen is because five years ago, they made the decision to put a lot of effort into this online thing. And I think this, this is just goes to show if you, if you run a company, you've got to start looking at what seed you're going to plant today to be able to bear fruit in the next four or five years and down the road. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I think we'll talk, be talking over the next two years a lot about artificial intelligence. Why? Because we need to keep raising the awareness uh, among uh, our customers out there. And those of you listening should be paying a lot of attention to what we're saying and, and also doing your own research because this, this is, breakthrough stuff that could help you build entirely new value delivery systems. And it's, it's like, it's, it's like being the first person at the world book encyclopedia to realize you could put it on a DVD. If you get the idea early and you put the world book on a, on a CD ROM or a DVD, you know, in 1979 and you're ahead of the game, you would have been Google, you know, you'd have turned out that way. So that's what we want our customers to be. This is another new, new piece of technology. It's growing rapidly. It's got a lot of applications and, and I cannot, I cannot encourage people enough. There's no over encouragement possible in terms of understanding artificial intelligence and its application these days. Okay. In the true uh, fashion of how we entered this conversation, I just asked chat G, uh, GPT to tell us how to say goodbye on a podcast. You ready to hear it? I'm ready. Thanks for tuning in folks. It's been a great having you with us today. Don't forget to tune in next time for more great content. Until then, goodbye and take care. <laughs> Thank you, Manny. All right, cheers. <laughs>